eat, greet all of you tonight in the name of Christ. Those of you who have joined us on live stream as well. This will be our 30th exposition in the book of Amos. As I have reminded you quite often, this is a, from one standpoint, was a difficult book. Not difficult to understand. I mean, it's, <laughs> if you don't understand this book, I mean, you've got some real problems. But you're being exposed to a part of God that is not may not be easy to see. But it must be seen. This is the real God we're being exposed to here. This is really how he responds to waywardness in his people. And it's important to see. Does there come a time is this so that there comes a time when the Lord is actually against people that he chose and blessed? We're going to find out yes. <laughs> yes, it is, in spite of the teaching of a lot of people. Some would say that that's impossible for God to choose a people, love a people, care for people, and be against them and become their enemy. Well, they're, they're just wrong. That's all we're going to show that that's the case. Through Moses, God warned his people about this trait. This is a divine trait now. Here's what he said. Listen to the nature of these words. The final Leviticus 26, 23 through 25. And if ye will not be reformed by me, that, is that strong? Yeah. You may say, well, God can reform anybody. If you will not be reformed by me, by these things, but will walk contrary to me, then will I also walk contrary to you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. And I will bring together within your cities, I will send the pestilence, I will bring the sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. Boy. And when ye are gathered together within your cities, I will send a pestilence among you, and ye shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. That, as it were, early on, early on now, God told Israel that. Now, we're taught that God doesn't change. So this nature of God, this hasn't changed. I'm going to be right up front with you. There are some of God's people that are walking contrary to him. I don't know that any of them are here tonight, but if they, if they are, they need, they, need, they need to address this. There are some people walking contrary to God that were his name. They have a quarrel with his covenant. Hmm? And God's not going to tolerate it. Amen. Speaking of the same people as those to whom Amos is speaking, God once said this through Ezekiel. And say to the land of Israel, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am against thee. And will draw forth my sword out of his sheath, and will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked. It's Ezekiel 21.3. This is God, though. This is God talking. Amen. Jeremiah, he spoke of this kind of judgment. Jeremiah 17.13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed. Uh, we all know some people like this that have forsaken the Lord. They will be ashamed. This has not escaped God's attention. Amen. And they shall depart, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. That is, I'll make it public. I'll make a public, I'll make a public display of them. Those that forsake me. No, <laughs> this is God. Yeah. Let's take another one here. Second Samuel twenty two twenty seven. With the pure 
Thou wilt show thyself pure with the froward. Thou wilt show thyself unsavory. So you want to tell the froward that God loves them. Do you? Do you? God shows himself unsavory to the froward. Here's just stated another way. Thou wilt show thyself to the pure. Thou wilt show thyself pure to the froward. Thou wilt show thyself froward. Well, these are certainly not pleasant things to consider from one point of view, but these are written for our learning. This is an aspect of God that you got to know. God, he will not allow you to t retaliate. Yeah. You cannot retaliate. Yeah. But God must retaliate. Yeah. Amen. That's his nature. Mm -hmm. He tells you, hands off, I'll handle this, but I will avenge. Yeah. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And so we pray about these things we're talking about tonight. We know God's nature. The people of God to understand that even now, when the covenant of blessing is in force, it is possible to provoke God. Perhaps even while uh, imagining that we are stronger than he, you know, Paul said to the Corinthians, do you provoke, do we provoke God? Are you stronger than he? <laughs> see, you've got to see this, brethren, that when someone speaks against or persecutes the people of God, they're provoking God. Amen. He that touches you touches the apple of my eye. Yeah. God's serious about this. Ye have not done it unto them, you have done it unto me, Jesus said. To the least of these, my brethren. If you just neglect the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me, and I'll send you to hell for doing it. That's what he said in Matthew 25. Depart from me into everlasting fire. That's what he said. So we're talking about time. Serious things here. Now we're in Amos 5, 16 through 18. Yes. When you consider that, I will, I will avenge. You didn't make a point of that. When Nahum prophesied, he said you reserveth wrath for his enemies. That's right. When he builds up, and like I thought about what Jesus said, where he said, if you fed one of these little ones, you better that millstone yeah. be tied around your neck, caps and dips the sea. It's like that needs to be known. Like whatever you do, God's going to do something about that. Yeah, this yeah. Is, this is, it's always serious to come against God, whether you come against him personally, you come against his people, whether you charge him falsely, you charge his people falsely, you denigrate his son. Say this is not overlooked by God. That don't you practice overlooking it. it. This should cause great care to you. But you cast it on the Lord. You can't resolve the matter yourself, but God will. Amen. Amen. We'll just say, we pray that he'll do it rather quickly. Now, again, we have some very uh, hard language here, but he started this uh, diatribe against Israel in the third chapter. We're now in... To close, closing up the fifth, he's still talking to Israel. That's how bad the condition of Israel was. Judah, he just couple a couple of verses, huh? just a couple of verses said something about Judah, and he just a few verses to all these nations that he mentioned about five, five or six of them. Hey, just just kind of brief. To whom much is given, much is required. So he's he's really this is extensive. Verses 16 through 18 of Amos 5. Therefore the, Lord, therefore the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord saith thus, Wailing shall be in all streets. They shall say in all, all the highways, Alas, alas. And they shall call the husbandmen to mourning, and such as are skillful of lamentation to wailing. And in all vineyards shall be wailing, for I will pass through thee, saith the Lord. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Amen. 
I don't know what Moses meant when he said, I exceedingly fear and quake. You get on this mountain and you begin to hear God talk like this, and it'll put the fear of God in you. Yeah. It'll do it. Amen. Now let me just precede these words with an affirmation that God is here depicted as, what God is depicted as doing is not his preference. This is not, God's not seeking for opportunities to do this. He does it purpose to do this. This is not high on his agenda. But his nature dictates that he do this. See, salvation is a matter of God's will and of his deliberate purpose. He has, there's a sense in which he's purposed to destroy the wicked, but he has a, a, a developed an extensive plan to do this see but he to save people that's something else he has developed an extensive means of salvation so I do want to make that clear that this is not God's preference to do the things that he said here he doesn't take a special delight in doing them we're being exposed to the nature of God who cannot abide obstinance and iniquity. This is this is what God is. But see, this people are slow to accept this. And particularly in our day, God has been so misrepresented, some people are actually offended by a language like this. And they might say, well, that was in the Old Testament, or something like that. If men insist on flaunting their iniquity, in the face of God, in the name of religions, which is what Israel was doing, remember. They were going through a form of religion. If they do this, insist on doing this, they will awaken God's indignation. This is his nature. This happened early in the history of the church when Ananias and Sapphira misrepresented who they were. And it awakened this trait of God. They both died because of it. It was made known in Corinth where the people were conducting themselves improperly at the table of the Lord and God made a lot of them sick and he caused some to die. Their conduct awakened. Now this should go without saying but let me say it anyway. You want to live to awaken his mercy and awaken his grace. Amen. Everybody wakes up some trait of God. Everybody wakes up some facet of God's nature. You want to awaken his mercy and his kindness and his grace and his love. See, and uh, if you seek him and live for him, this is this, these are the things that he exhibits towards you. It's actually wonderful. What you're showing here is that when sin goes unaddressed, unrepented, God is going to do something about it, whether it's a meeting or another day, just something's going to be done, but today, like you were saying, people will get offended when you talk about this, the conclusion seems to be, well, nothing's going to happen. That's right. And because of that, they'll live without any sense of consequence. That's right. Yeah. They have no fear of God right. for their eyes, yes. It happened the church at Pergamos. They awakened this indignation of the Lord Jesus and he said to them repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth that doesn't mean he'll just say something corrective sword of his mouth it means he'll with a word he'll awaken some enemies against them in Christ Jesus see provision is made for the remission of sins remission of sin and liberation from the guilt and power of sin. There's an abundance of grace to sin Christ. To live in such a manner as not to provoke God. That's why it's inexcusable to provoke him. All the means are there not to provoke God. The sacrifice and intercession of Christ is not a means of merely of subduing God's wrath. It's a means of opening the, the depository of salvation. <clears throat> I do not believe this is clear. 
to most professing Christians. I don't. I don't think this is a, is this is too blurry. People don't see it clearly. I can tell the way they respond and how they talk. They that doesn't mean they don't want to see it. I'm just saying they don't see it clearly. They can't. They have a hard time conceiving of God as being this way. But this is the way he is. I'm saying that God is being provoked by the professing church just like he was provoked by Israel. Because they don't know him. If they knew him, they wouldn't provoke him. That's right. And the fact that they didn't know him provoked him. See, you, you may think that not knowing God is like an innocent. No, it's not an innocent thing. Man was made to know God. He's put in God's world that has his marks all over it. He was given a conscience about God. His official vocation is to seek the Lord and find him. So it's not innocent not to know the Lord. If you're in Timbuktu or if you're in Joplin, it's not innocent. You say, well, they're just young. It's still not innocent. Amen. The fact that we got a generation of young people that are bordering on stupid, this doesn't excuse them. This doesn't excuse them. Jesus was 12 when he went to the temple. <laughs> Samuel was a boy when he went. See, so young age doesn't stop you from in a quest for God. I, I've met people who, when it comes to education and just being, understanding things, they're very sharp on certain things, but you talk to them about what God, and they don't. That's right. But then on the other hand, I've met people who are very well educated, but they're sensitive to the Lord and very sharp when it comes to the things of the Lord. So it, it is the people's desires, what they want. That's right. But you never treat the ignorance of God as though it's innocent. Well, if ignorance is a benefit, then there's no point to the spread of the gospel. That's right. That would be the, that would be the gospel message. Just shut your mouth and don't say anything, because as long as they don't know, they're safe. That's right. Everybody can see this, can't you? The ignorance of God is inexcusable. Amen. It's existed it's everywhere. Everywhere there's man, the ignorance of God exists, but it's still inexcusable. Just because everybody's ignorant doesn't mean it's all right. Revenge on those who know not know God. Not know God. not God, that's ignorance. Now our text <coughs> begins, Therefore the Lord, the God of hosts. Therefore the Lord, the God of hosts. Or the God of armies is what the, the idea See, he has armies at his disposal. Now, I want to just say a brief word about this. It isn't that God, so to speak, can't do anything unless he's got some help. I mean, it's, God is so holy, he cannot deal directly yeah. with humanity. If he did, yeah. he'd destroy him. See, as a fire goes before him, destroys. So he had, but he has armies that <laughs> can deal effectively with his enemies. Actually, this is a... This is actually, in a sense, a blessing. Yeah, amen. Yeah. The fact that God hides himself and doesn't just come on the scene in all of his glory. He's, he said he's, he's a God of hosts that carry out his will that makes recovery possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can see that, can't you? Yes, I gather these are angelic in nature, these armies, any one of which could handle multitudes of people. They're employed to keep the wrath of God from just utterly decimating and destroying all the people. So it, God's wrath is sort of, it's not dumbed down is the wrong word, but God's wrath is mitigated a little bit by this army carrying it out, who are not, this, these angels, they aren't noted for compassion now. But they're, they're a considerable distance between God and them in nature <laughs> and so they are uh, he sends them a fire goes out before the Lord destroying and burning up his enemies round about Psalm 97 3 so he can't personally and when he came as a when he sent a savior he, the, 
Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was uh, toned down, <laughs> toned down. Even if they had the demons knew who he was, they, they were they were free. They were afraid of him. They, they recognized man didn't see. That, that's why he was able to walk among them. Do you remember God can hold his armies back? One time when they were destroying Jerusalem, First Chronicles 21, he held them back. Uh, that's enough. That, that's enough. See, but if God were personally among us in, in all of his glory, he, he couldn't restrain his yeah. he couldn't restrain his wrath. God doesn't just like restrain himself. So what he does, he funnels his wrath through lower servants and he can, he restrains it that way. Let's just thank God for the angels. Amen. Now he says wailing will be in all streets. Wailing. Some of the versions say weeping or crying or lamentation or cry out in anguish. See, this word wailing, the English language breakdown breaks down here. There is not adequate word for wailing. It's a very strong word. If you're lexically, it means to tear the hair and beat the breasts. This is what Orientals do. They tear their clothes, beat their breasts, throw dust on their heads. The idea is of hopeless weeping. There's nothing you can do about it. Just hopeless, hopeless weeping with a heart so broken the whole body convulses in grief. And there's... Yes. I saw this kind of expression in a man. I had to go tell him that his son was killed on a motorcycle. Yeah. That's it. About three years ago. A man from Iran lives yeah. in this community. He went out to his home to tell his wife and he threw himself on the floor like a child. Yeah. His family had to restrain him from hurting himself. Yeah. You saw it. Yeah. I was going to say that I have, I have personally experienced this kind of grief t two times in my life. We're just reduced to convulsive weeping that is, t one was when I returned to the Lord after two years of living a sinful, very wicked, unimaginably wicked life. That was one. Another was a set of circumstances that surrounded the death of my first wife. That's lost all, lost all control, sobbed and grieved, you know, and he, I couldn't stop. I to think that to think of that as a prolonged experience. See, this is whew, that was what God said is going to happen. It, it's the weeping that there's nothing I can do about it, but the pain is still there, the grief still there, the hurt's still there, and there's not a thing I can do about it, and it just compounds the problem. Wailing will be in all the streets. <laughs> Everywhere you go, you'll never see someone that's not wailing. That's what he's saying. They'll all be wailing. The heavens will be like brass. As Moses said, the earth like iron, and the inhabitants are smashed in between. Not a thing they can do about it. Wailing, wailing, wailing. They shall say, alas, alas. It's another, it's a, word, it's a, hard, it's a hard word to put into English. Some versions say, sorrow, sorrow. One version says, oh, no, oh, no. It's, it's a cry of helplessness. It's, it's hard to put into the English language. Whoa, whoa. The Message Bible kind of catches a sense. He says, not me, not us, not now. Cry of hopelessness, hopelessness, all around. The pulpit commentary calls it the death wail. Summer's gone, the harvest is past, and we're not saved. Nothing we can do about it. We see now. We see now. We see now. We did the wrong thing. We see it now, but there's nothing they can do about it. Nothing at all. For three sins, yea, three transgressions, yea, four. See, they went over. Where the prophets kept telling them. Prophets kept telling them, God sent them earth prophets early, early enough to they could recover themselves, but they didn't pay attention, didn't pay attention. Now the hammer falls. 
this is the part that I think many people will deny God. They'll, so some will admit that God will lead you through sorrow, but it's always in order that you'll repent. But they don't believe that this kind of sorrow never ends. That's right. It's not under repentance, it's under judgment. That's right. Mm. Yes, it's a, it's a dreadful thing to, uh, to consider. The lament of a fallen kingdom. Kingdom that God chose and ordained. Yeah. Fallen. No future. It's the kind of thing that will brought, be brought to the highest point by the inhabitants in hell. Yeah. That's going to be the, the highest. The, the harvest is past. There will be no more reaping. Summer's gone. No more growing. And we're not saved. And that dirge will be sung ages without end. Regret, regret, regret. Yeah. Why didn't I listen? Maybe my brothers could have been saved. You know, we're dealing with God here. God's the one that's going to make that happen. Amen. Yes. We're considering just hopelessness itself. That that kind of cry is often uttered when there's there's no perceived end in sight. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Amen. When people hear words like this. Verily I say unto you, I know you not. That's going to induce this wailing. Or, but he shall say, I tell you, I know not. I know you not when ye are depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. It's what Solomon called suddenly destroyed, and that without remedy. Proverbs twenty nine one. This wailing is is akin to that kind of wailing. And mourning, said, and mourning. And such a, they're going to call a husbandman. <laughs> We're not mourning enough. A husband, come on in. You're not getting any crops. Come on in here and carry the tenor on this mourning. And then that we need some professional mourners. Okay. Yeah. Such as a skillful of lamentation. We need some professional mourners that can really cry out loud. And they do it as they eat. They still have these professional mourners. Mourning. It's, it's, we're mourning, but that's not enough. There needs to be more mourning. The situation is that bad. Mourning and wailing, hopeless wailing, in the streets, in the highways, in places of commerce, while you travel, in the field. all join in this doleful song. Can people re be reduced to that state? Yeah. Yes. You may live to see it. I haven't seen a lot of this, but I've seen some people that died in distress. Huh? It's not pleasant to see. Died in distress. One man, my father and I went to minister to, a vile man was in such pain. He says, it's too late. Just leave me alone. I'm, I'm suffering too much. Yeah. Hard to see someone like that. I know people that if they don't change, that's how they'll die. Yeah. And that's not, that's just the prelude. That's just the prelude to condemnation. Why? Because it's that serious to reject God. It's that serious to provoke God. It's that serious to go your own stubborn way when you know what God requires of you. It's that serious. And in all vineyards shall be wailing. He <laughs> continues on. In all vineyards there shall be wailing. That is, a, these beautiful vineyards, we're not getting any grapes. It's no harvest. 
Mrs. Babel says, I want to hear it loud and clear. Wail it out. You planted these vineyards. You cultivated these vineyards. You labored in these vineyards. No fruit. Wailing. It's one in which all labor was expended in vain. Everything they sought to do was frustrated. I think of the people that spend their whole life trying to be secure when they're old. And they die when they're 50, 60 years old. Wasted, wasted lives. Didn't prepare to meet God. Isaiah said this about this kind of situation. Gladness is taken away and joy out of the plentiful field. And in the vineyards there shall be no singing. Neither shall there be shouting. The treaders shall tread but no wine in their wine presses. In their presses, I have made their vintage shouting to cease. Harvest was a happy time. Reap the fields, singing, shouting, treading out with shouts of joy. Now the treaders, no fruit, no juice. Think of the thoroughness of the judgment like this. Look how thorough it is. Gladness is taken away. The sweet elixir that makes life tolerable. Sometimes if you can just be glad, you can endure some rather difficult circumstances. But when gladness is taken away, oh, that's a, th a sad thing. Neither plentiful feel nor joy there will be neither plentiful field nor joy that it produces. I took it all away. I took away every source of satisfaction and joy. See, you didn't derive your satisfaction from me. You refused me. I will not let you, God says, find satisfaction anywhere else. You will wail and you will lament. Isaiah said... <clears throat> Isaiah 24, 8 and 9. The mirth of tabret ceaseth, the noise of them that rejoice endeth, the joy of the harp ceaseth, they shall not drink wine with the strong, strong drink shall be bitter to them that drink it. See? The thing you once, that once meant much to you and you enjoyed taken away. The vintage shall fail. Isaiah also said, Isaiah 32, 10. Jeremiah said, Jeremiah 48, 33, and joy and gladness is taken from the plentiful field and from the land of Moab. They said, this is, this is what happened to Moab, who was heathens. Moab, and I have caused wine to fail with the wine press, and none shall tread with shouting, and their shouting shall be no shouting. Moab. Israel got what Moab got. Oh, that's a... That's a tragic state of affairs. Joel, he spoke of this kind of thing, too. The vine is dried up, the fig tree languishes, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. See, that's one thing that's going to be present in hell. No joy. No satisfaction. No companionship, no friends, none of that. Go ahead, take it away. I think everyone knows we're, we're living in a time and a generation where even theologians and church people can't bear the doctrine of hell oh, yeah. or <laughs> yes. wrath or judgment or eternal punishment. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a couple of things that, that I think people either forget or they will maybe willfully forget. One is that people who end up under the wrath of God are not going to end up under the wrath of God never having been exposed to anything about God. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. everyone has some Amen. kind Amen. of of inkling a revelation, they ought to seek God, even pagan people. Amen. Even pagan people know they ought to seek God. There's some kind of revelation that's given. It's not, it's not the same to everybody. Um, 
but everyone has some. Everyone who rejects God has sinned against some kind of light right, in yeah. Revelation. And so it's not as if God is going to condemn people who have never heard or never had a chance. Mm -hmm. or something. That isn't that isn't the case at all. That's right. He's going yeah, to con he's going to condemn people who had a chance and rejected these yeah. people that Amos is talking about. Now these are covenant people. Mm -hmm. So they sinned against the greatest light that, that was available at that time. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Another thing that people forget, and I think this because people don't know God, is there there isn't anything good <coughs> apart from God. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not as if you have two options. That you can have something really good with God or something that's not quite as good without God. That's not the option. That's right. There yeah. isn't anything good with God. Amen. And, and this is taught throughout Scripture. It's actually epitomized in Eden. Mm -hmm. That's right. When, when, God, when, Amen. when the Lord said, you shall surely die, mm -hmm. he didn't mean they were going to fall over dead because they didn't. He meant that there is nothing good apart from me. That's death. In the ultimate sense. Amen. Yes. Amen. Remember that time Jesus was toward the end of his ministry and he was hungry. <clears throat> he saw a tree, <coughs> fig tree, afar off. And it looked like it had fruit on it. it a lot of greenery on it and looked looked pretty productive. He got down there. He saw a fig tree in the way. He came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only. And the scripture tells you it wasn't the time of figs. Yeah. <laughs> if you go by the season, this wasn't the time to get figs. But this tree looked like it had produced figs out of season. Untimely figs, the Bible calls them. Untimely figs. But it just had leaves. So Jesus said, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. Yeah, presently the fig tree withered away. Now here's what's happened to Israel. God come to examine them, and they didn't have anything but leaves. They just had religious rituals, perfunctory exercises shallow music, sacrifices to a calf, nothing but leaves. So he said, that's it. Yeah. You're not going to bear any fruit. Yeah. That's right. See? Amen. I think that has possibly happened to some people and they don't know it. Yeah. God has dried them up. You said earlier, you said that God's purposed salvation, but see this judgment is a it's like a byproduct. That's right. Because the, the purpose is to save, and yet people who reject, he has a provision, but it, that's not his main his main thing. He's saving people. Yeah. And and but if you won't believe, well, yes. then that's when his judgment comes Amen. in. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. God is saving people in the fellowship with Himself. He's preparing the riches of His grace. That's right. For yes. His presence in His presence for them. The others. Yeah, see, everybody, They're just sent away, and so there is nothing. Everybody by nature is headed the headed to the other way. Yes, that's right. <laughs> the other that's way. Right. But salvation it needs you a way to get out of that Amen. path to destruction right. and people who don't avail themselves of it. Yeah. Yes. Example of the fig tree that you gave. It, it, it reminded me of the phrase you often <laughs> use that's fluff and stuff. That false doctrine is nothing. It, there's no real substance to it. That's right. But you you can have the best car in the world, but if there's no motor in it, it's in vain. The yeah. work to produce it was in vain, and it's not going to go anywhere. If there's no growth behind a quote doctrine, it is of no value to anyone. That's right. Doctrine. The gospel allows for growth. It's conducive to growth. And if you aren't growing on a doctrine, then it's of no use yeah. to you, and you must get rid of it. You, I'm, I'm astounded on a daily ba on a daily basis. I'm astounded at the froth of modern Christianity. It's astounding. Exceeding riches of His grace, and depths profound, and people are just like spider walking on water. Spiders can walk on water, you know. 
Now let's consider the current absence of joy. That's what he said he's going to take away all the delight, all the joy, take it away. This kind of judgment is taking place in Babylon the Great. Satan's fabrication of the church. Spiritual joy has been taken away. You've got to really be able to see this. For instance, the joy described as rejoicing in hope. When I say taken away, that doesn't mean no one has it. It means that it, as a rule, no one has it. Rejoicing in the Lord, Philippians 3.1. There's been a near cessation of great joy and consolation. It comes from beholding the love of the brethren and the faithful refreshment because of the bowels of the saints that have been refreshed. See, joy and refreshment, these are like, they're not common at all. They've been taken away. Why? Because God hasn't been served. That's why. The same thing, the same condition that Israel fell into, this is the condition that modern Christendom has fallen into the same condition. There is a consolation and a rejoicing that comes from believing in God. Amen. It says of the Philippian jailer when he was baptized, says they, then they rejoiced believing in God. See? <laughs> John said, he rejoiced greatly to hear thy children are walking in the truth. That, well, see, this kind of rejoicing is kind of sparse today. Then he says, I, I, will, pass, I will pass through thee. This is what's going to cause a cessation. I'm going to end up waiting. I'm going to pass through thee. That's what happened when the voice of God is heard walking in the garden. God is passing God is passing through. The more God has given to his people, the more exacting he'll be when he passes through. See, when Jesus wrote those letters, had John write the letters to the churches, he was passing through. Examining, testing, passing through. You take, for example, ourselves here tonight. God has been very good to us. He's given us to see things that a lot of people, for whatever reason, have not seen yet. He's given us to hear them frequently and people to expound them frequently. Now, when he passes through, he's not looking for first church at a frigidaire. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He'd better not find nominal believers in a group like this. God's chosen to save people through specific means. Now, Christ is an expert at making people ready right. for, to, to, to meet God, to be in God's presence and live. Yeah. And yet, he's going to use these means. That's he's not right. going to like supernaturally come down and just zap you. Now you're ready. No, you're going to have to believe the gospel. Right. You're going to have to help develop a love for the truth. But if, that, if the, those means aren't appealing to you, then you fall into this category. Amen. Now you know that when a man is an architect of a structure and commissions it to be built, he passes through to examine yes, examine right. the structure and see yes. whether the building project is going along as as planned. Well, Jesus is the same way. He passes passes through. Now sometimes, and he says, "I'll pass through." For I will pass through thee, saith the Lord. And then the next, he's going to raise up a wall, too. Hosea 2.6 says that. I, he's passing through now. I will hedge up thy way with thorns and make a wall that she shall not find her paths. So Jesus passes through and things aren't what they should be. People aren't as advanced as they should be. For the reason of time, they ought to be teachers. Yeah. But they had someone, they'd be teaching the first principles again. What's he do? He hedges up the way with thorns so living becomes painful. <laughs> oh, the Lord can make living hurt. 
They put a wall up so they can't get done what they want to get. That's what happens in these kind of judgments like we're reading about here. He's hedged up the way with horn, thorns. Now for Israel, they'd, they just barge through. <laughs> they cut themselves all up. Now see this last verse. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Now remember, Amos is prophesying to a people that thought God was for them. Uh, they, they thought they were living with this in mind. God's, uh, God's for us. They had outward displays of unimaginable devotion. They weren't like the religious people of our day. They made sacrifices, a lot of sacrifices, sang a lot, prayed a lot. They went through a lot of religious routine. They had their, uh, but yeah, they had three transgressions, yea, four. They had their places of worship. Had a golden calf put up there down Bethel. They had sacrifices, as Amos 4.4. 4. They had religious feasts, Amos 8.10. They had songs and instrumental music, Amos 5.23. It all looked impressive. Probably someone say, boy, they really come a long way. That's great. That was really... Really good today, wasn't it? All that music and the singing and everything. But they imposed burdens on the poor. These same people, that's what they were charged with. They imposed burdens on the poor, crushed the needy, and took bribes and perverted judgment. These same people. So God speaks to this people. Woe to you that desire the day of the Lord. <laughs> they actually thought that they'd be advantaged if God come down and they'd really be advantaged by it. They said it to Isaiah 519. Let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it, and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. Wait, let the Lord come down. We Amos says. What are, you, what are you doing wanting the day of the... Why do you want the Lord to come to you? That's what he's asking them now. Let's look at it more closely. Jeremiah 17, 15. Behold, they say unto me, where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. Hey, come on. What did God have to say? What's the word for today? Tell it to us. Ezekiel affirmed that Israel had rejected knowledge. Son of man, behold, they of the house of Israel say, The vision that he seeth is for many days to come. And he prophesieth of the times that are far off. That doesn't have anything to do with us. People, people have been thinking all along that Jesus is going to come at any time. This is talk. If that's way down there someplace. It, this doesn't really pertain to us. The people imagined God was for them. They imagined God would bless them and protect them. And sometimes people talk like that. They talk like just like God cares for everybody. God's going to bless everybody. God protects everybody. And if you ever been around many funerals, it, it's kind of common people talk that way. They were living out what Paul described in his letter to the Jewish believers in Rome is the Romans 2, 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. Thou art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a, bl a light of them that are in darkness. Mm -hmm. But the tragic circumstance was they had misassessed their situation. That kind of mentality exists today in a lot of places. All right, now to people like that, he asks, to what end is it for you? How will the Lord showing up bring an advantage to you? 
I mean, some people say, well, what he'll do? Well, he'll heal our marriage. He'll make our kids come home. Well, this is taught. If you haven't heard this, this is taught. He'll bring our kids home. We'll, fight, we'll have enough money to meet all our bills. To what end? Other versions read, What good is the day of the Lord to you? It's a New King James Bible. New Revised Standard, Why do you want the day of the Lord? Why, why are you singing a song about the coming of the Lord? Why is this group singing about the coming of the Lord? What's that going to advantage? What are you singing about heaven for? That's how we'd say it today. <laughs> Why do you long for that day? God's Word Bible. What benefit can come to people like you? It's what Amos is challenging. What benefit, can, what benefit can come to people like you if the Lord shows up? It'll, it'll be your condemnation. It won't be any blessing for you. Yeah. What a tragic circumstance to be in might be good to ask some people, you know that. Say, do you, do you think Jesus is coming again? Oh, yeah, we believe that. We believe that. Our church teaches that. Well, what advantage are you going to have when he does come? You'll find a lot of people haven't thought, exactly thought about it this way. They assume too much. Could in your prayers and in your rehearsing of the coming of the Lord... Think what advantage it will bring to you when Jesus comes. Just ponder it. See, if you're a godly person, you, well, you'll think of a lot of things that'll buoy up your spirit, Amen. make you strong in the Lord. Say, well, the day of the Lord for you <laughs> is darkness and not light. Yeah. The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Not to everybody, but to people like you, uh -huh. he said. The prophet tells Israel that for them the day of the Lord would bring no benefit at all. What a thought. It'd be more like Sinai. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that happened at Sinai. There was blackness and darkness and fire shooting out and thunder and earthquake. And the people weren't saying, what a blessing it is to be here at Mount Sinai where God has come down. Glory be to God for this occasion. Nobody said that. Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. And he was a holy man. <laughs> they have only desired the day of the Lord because of their ignorance of God and blindness of heart. They really don't think about the coming of God with any particular benefit. They just think he'll come and solve all of our problems. That's what will happen. They don't realize that God has become their enemy. Yeah, Here's a word that Samuel delivered to King Saul. The Lord has departed from thee and has become thine enemy. Yeah. Now, it wasn't always that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. When Saul was first king, he was... He was young and easily directable. Samuel commended him for it. But he says, God's your enemy. You probably know some people, and if you think about it, God's become their enemy. Here's another Lamentations 2.5. Here's Jeremiah lamenting. The Lord was, the Lord was as an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all her palaces. He had destroyed his strongholds and had increased in the daughter of Judah, mourning and lamentation. Come an enemy. To his people, he became an enemy. Thus Amos tells the people when the Lord comes, it will not be to help. It will be to judge and to chasten. It will not be a time of marvelous light be a time of unfathomable darkness and ignorance. Malachi said it this way, Behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Now, brethren, 
salvation is to get you out of that category. Yeah, and is thoroughly able to do it. Yes. To get you out of that category. In speaking to the churches, the Holy Spirit speaks of the fall of Babylon. When what is mentioned in our text is going to take place on a, a larger, larger scale. Then although the people that pretended they loved and served the Lord, the entire superstructure of false and pretentious Christianity will come crashing down. And there'll be some who have profited from Babylon that will lament. Thus it is written, all who wax rich through the, del through the abundance of Babylon's delicacies will lament. They'll lament the great whore with whom they committed fornication. For in one hour, thy judgment has come. They shall weep and mourn over her, but to no avail. For God shall pass through her. And when he does, he'll cause her demise. But when he passes through the church, <laughs> the body of the redeemed, the people who have trusted in him, lean the weight of their soul upon him, he will come to save them Amen. and take them to their true abode. So I bid you to prepare for Jesus passing through. Live so tonight, if Jesus visits you and passes through you and assesses your life, you'll have a good report. And you'll, have, you'll have good cause to praise God and give honor to him. Live tomorrow with that in mind. Jesus may pass through tomorrow. May we all be ready. Yeah. Hard text. Hard text. But uh, God wants us to see this. He wants us to be able to kind of adapt this to our situation because this is a commentary on, on God, on an aspect of God that Jesus delivers you from. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. Any of you have a word you'd like to add? Yes, Brother Jason. The, the only thing that can produce this condition that we just were talking about on this last page yeah. here is is bad religion. That's right. There's it's kind of an unusual phenomenon That's actually. Right. I mean if Amen. you if you only hang out with religious people, you kind of get used to this. <laughs> but if you if you start right. if you start talking to pagan people, see most pagan people are not pretentious. They'll just tell you, I don't believe in God. Yeah. I don't know I don't want God to come down. Are you kidding me? I mean, that's the kind of stuff they'll say. Religious people don't do that. Yeah. They, they're pretentious. See, they're, they're, it's, it's, it's an act. It's just like Jesus said about the Pharisees. They, Hypocrite means an actor. That's right. That's what it is. On stage. <laughs> but the, the funny thing is, though, is that this when people play a religious game, it makes them immune to the real thing. That's right. Very good. That's right. That's why it's such a serious... Because they think they know God, so it's hard to talk them out of that. So. Amen. Yes, yeah, this word on wrath, it, it makes us appreciate what Jesus has done all the more. That's because right. we've not been appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we see God's righteous standard, that he's unyielding in it, it's a, it's a good word to know that Jesus has brought in everlasting righteousness. Amen. 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 Yes, Sister Melissa. In this uh, point, they had skillful wellers. I mean, that, that proves that they were at the point of no return, so to speak. That they, they were deserving of this wrath of God because they had already passed that point. That it, it didn't matter. They were they would never repent anyway. That's right. Amen. As we're going through, Amos, it does make me think about the state that some nations are in. 
because I remember Brother Jason said earlier that God's not like condemning people who've never heard, but people who've heard and rejected. That's yeah. what brought the judgment. I think about these countries, even islands, where people are they're like animals. Yeah. They like seem. It just makes you think are they that way because they never heard, or because they rejected the gospel? I'm not going to say make a final judgment, but it is something to think about. Yeah, the first first time I went to India in 1980, I told them why their nation was the way it was. It says, your nation killed Thomas, the apostle. Now, God can forgive you, I understand it, but this is not just coincidence that this nation is the way it is. And there's other nations, there's, there's historical records that tell you where the apostles all visited and where men of God visited. They visited all these nations early in the first century. Most of them were killed. Yeah. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this solemn warning that Amos delivered. We thank you for Amos. That he was faithful to deliver this word. It was not a pleasant word to deliver. And for a man of tender heart, it would be especially difficult. But we're grateful that it is in Scripture, that it does tell us this, how you respond to a hip hypocritical religion. And we ask for a complete deliverance from it. In Jesus' name, amen.